Hello, I'm Professor Brian Boucher. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to take a look at the 3M company financial statements and see what their disclosures say about their stockholders' equity, stock-based compensation, and earnings per share. Let's get started. Okay, we're going to start on page 45 on 3M's income statement, or as they say, consolidated statement of income. As we go down, we can see net income attributable to 3M. 44, 44. Then there's the weighted average shares outstanding under basic calculation. So those are the actual shares outstanding. 693.9 gives us a basic EPS of 640. Then there's the number of shares outstanding under the diluted calculation. And we take the net income attributable divided by that 703.3 to get diluted EPS of 632. So it's about 8 cents per share once we do the dilution. So a couple things to notice, looks like there's about 10 million shares that would be converted if we look at diluted EPS, and there's no adjustment for the net income. We use the same net income in, as a numerator in both, so that means that there's no convertible debt where we'd have to adjust the numerator. Yes, it also means there's no preferred dividends because we didn't do any uh, adjustment for preferred dividends in either case. So it looks like this entire 10 million of shares is due to stock-based compensation. Next, we go to page 48 and the balance sheet, and we go down to the stockholders' equity section. So here we can see shareholders' equity. There's common stock with par, va par value of one penny. They don't tell us shares issued or shares authorized here. We could sort of ballpark the shares issued because they have a balance of $9 million in common stock, and if the par value is one cent, that would be about 900 million shares issued. We see the shares outstanding is 687 million. Then we have the additional paid in capital, retained earnings. Here's treasury stock. They don't tell us how much shares are in treasury, but if we have about 900 million here and about 687 here, then it's about 213 million. Uh, we'll be able to find the exact figures later. Uh, one thing I want you to keep in your head, though, is this 12407 of Treasury stock. Later on, we'll figure out the average price they paid for Treasury stock once we figure out the precise shares. And then, of course, here's our good friend, accumulated other comprehensive income, or in this case, accumulated other comprehensive loss of $4.75 million. Now, I know you're sitting here looking at that non-controlling interest and thinking to yourself, why won't he ever talk about non-controlling interest? Uh, I'll just briefly remind you what it is, but it is something that we're not going to get into in this course. So what happens is 3M buys more than 50% of the common stock of another company. They now control the company because they could outvote the other shareholders. They bring all the assets and liabilities onto of that company onto their financial statements. That's why it's called a consolidated balance sheet, consolidated statement of income. But their shareholders don't own 100% of those assets and liabilities. So this non-controlling interest represents the ownership of the assets and liabilities by people that are not 3M owners. These are the people that own the uh, minority stakes in the subsidiaries that then get consolidated. And again, we'd have to go through consolidation accounting for you to fully sort of understand the implications of this. We don't have the time. You could do a you could do a whole course on this. Um, I'm not going to do a whole course on this. So it's just beyond the scope of this course. On the next page is the statement of stockholders' equity. And we've got 2009 to 2010, 2010 to 2011. I'm going to jump ahead to what happened between December 2011 and December 2012. So just going through the columns, we've got a total of everything, but we really want to look at the specific columns. So here's common stock and additional paid in capital. And you can see that there was an impact due to stock-based compensation. So that's the credit to APIC that you do when you recognize stock compensation expense. So the stock compensation expense was around 277. In the retained earnings column, we can see that net income made it go up. Dividends made it go down. We can see specifically that they paid 236 per share in dividends. And then they've got this negative to retained earnings for issuances pursuant to stock option and benefit plans. So it looks like what 3M did here is instead of doing a debit to, or sorry, a, uh, yeah, debit to APIC, 
they ended up doing a debit to retained earnings for the difference between the treasury stock that they're going to issue and the cash received from employees. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But uh, typically this is in APEC, but you do have the option to put it in retained earnings. And of course it's 3M, so they must have done it right because it, you know 3M wouldn't make any mistakes. And then we've got treasury stock. So we had reacquired stock. That's the stock that they purchased during the year. And then the 1492 is what they issue to employees for stock options. And then finally, we have the column for AOCL, other comprehensive income. And here are the four items that go into it. Of course, the one that we've run into are the debt and, and equity securities unrealized gain of $4 million. If we drop down in the footnote, here is more information about Treasury stock, giving us the specific number of shares. So here we can see that there are 256 million of stock held in Treasury. And remember that number I told you to remember, the balance of 12,407 in Treasury stock, that's the balance at Treasury stock at year end. If we divide that by this 250, uh, let's round it up to 257, we get $48.27 per share. Wow, that's hideous handwriting. Anyway, that's the average price that 3M has paid for Treasury stock for all the stock that they hold. We can also do that calculation for 2012. So they reacquired 2220, they bought 25 million shares, so if we take 2220 divided by 25 million shares, we come up with $88.8 per share. And so what you can see is the stock price is much higher in 2012 than it was historically when 3M has been buying this treasury stock. On the next page is the statement of cash flows. And in the operating section, we can see a line for stock-based compensation expense of 223. Now notice that number is slightly different than the 277 that we saw before and probably more different than you can attribute to rounding error. Uh, I don't want to go into why this is different. This is one of those things that would make stock option uh, accounting its whole, a whole week of videos rather than just part of a week of videos. But this is the amount of expense that actually went into the income statement and it gets added back in the statement of cash flows. Then if we go down to the cash from financing section, we can see the treasury stock purchased, 2204. Um, before it said 2220, I have no idea why those two are different, but this kind of stuff happens all the time when you're using real financial statements. There's proceeds from the issuance of treasury stock pursuant to option and benefit plans, that's 1012. And so if you remember, it was 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue was the original cost of the treasury stock. We received 1012 in cash, which is a difference of 480. That 480 is essentially the quote unquote cash cost of the stock options, we bought 1492 worth of stock and sold it to employees of 1012 and took a quote unquote loss, so that loss doesn't show up anywhere in the income statement. And this 482 is essentially the same thing as this 478 right here, except for, of course, the usual rounding error, which seems to plague us. Um, one more thing in the cash from financing section there's excess tax benefits from stock based compensation of 62. These are the tax savings that 3M got from employees exercising the options. So they got $62 million of tax savings during 2012. So one of the things that's always frustrating to people learning accounting, and uh, I know you're probably frustrated because I'm cavalier about it, is how all these numbers that should be the same aren't the same. You know, and I keep making jokes about rounding errors or this always happens. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot more complexities than what I'm teaching you that cause some of these numbers to differ across the statements. Like with the stock option expense, there's forfeitures, uh, 
when people leave before the vesting period's over, there's adjustments that are made for that that can cause the numbers you see on the cash flow statement to not reconcile with the number that you see in the statement of stockholders' equity. So the numbers are close enough, and as long as they're close enough, don't worry that they don't match exactly. Uh, because the reason that they don't match exactly are things that are beyond the scope of the course. Did I mention that there are things beyond the scope of the course? Yeah, okay, well this is one of them also. Now I've jumped ahead to page 55 where there's a disclosure about earnings per share where they talk about how they calculate uh, basic and diluted earnings per share. Uh, the disclosure that you always want to look for is certain options outstanding were not included in the computation of diluted earnings per share because they would have a, not have had a dilutive effect. In other words, they're out of the money. And you can see that it was 12.6 million options in 2012. So there's an additional 12.6 million options out there that could turn into common stock if they ever got into the money. And then we go down below here and we can see the calculation for earnings per share, which is basically the same thing that we saw on the income statement. There's nothing new here. Below that, there's a discussion of stock-based compensation. So they have stock options, restricted stock, restricted stock units, performance shares, and the general employee stock purchase plan, or GESPB. And then they talk about how they do the accounting, but really most of the information is in note 14. Jumping ahead to note five on page 67. Here we get all the detail on common stock. So again, one cent par value, 3 billion shares authorized, 944 million shares issued. So we're only off by 44 million shares in a rough calculation. Treasury stock, there are 256 million shares, which we saw before. Preferred stock without par value of 10 million shares is authorized, but unissued. So 3M has could issue 10 million shares of preferred stock without going to get permission from the board because it's been authorized. They just have never issued it. And then we see a disclosure of AOCI or AOCL since it's a loss. Uh, and again, if you were looking at their marketable securities, this would be the place to go to dig out these unrealized gains or losses. And then if you learn these other items down the road, like the translation adjustment, pension plans, which is the biggest chunk here, or cash flow hedges for derivatives, you'd find the information here in AOCL. Finally, on page 111 is note 14, which is stock-based compensation. There is a lot of information about the plans at the start, which you can read through on your own if you're interested, interested in. I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but they will tell you about the kind of incentive uh, compensation plans that they have. Then we get down to a disclosure. We hadn't seen this one before. Pupco didn't have this disclosure, but it shows where stock-based compensation shows up on the income statement. So much like depreciation can be in COGS or SG&A, depending on what the equipment or buildings are used for, stock-based compensation can be spread into COGS, SG&A, or R&D, depending on whether it goes to employees who go through, whose wages go through COGS, go through SG&A or are considered R&D. Um, most of it is the SG&A and that's the top management incentive plans would be there. So here we get the 223 of stock-based compensation expense, which is the same number we saw in the cash flow statement. That's the number that actually went into the income statement. Um, then we have the uh, effect that has an income tax expense and then the net of tax effect. This table should look familiar. This is where we can see the number of options that have been granted. So given out this year, new to our employees. Exercise, so this is where the employees are actually buying back the stock at the exercise price. And then canceled, so they expire or they don't vest and so they go away. And if you wanted to do the calculations, you could take exercised times this weighted average exercise price and you would get the cash that we got from employees for, um, for, uh, for employees that exercise options during the year. And then we also have the options exercisable. These are ones that have vested and co could go ahead and be exercised at any point. Then if we go down below here, this is where they show you the details on the Black-Scholes option pricing model. So if you still have that formula in front of us, all you have to do is plug in these parameters and you end up with the fair value of the options, which 
the fair value granted were $14.94. Now, of course, that's much, much less than the exercise price because what this fair value is measuring is the expected profit that you're going to get in holding the options where remember if it goes uh, the stock price goes down you get nothing and if it goes up then you get the gap between the increase in stock price and that exercise price and it goes on and there's more information in here about their restricted stock units again the same kind of disclosures that we've seen before and at this point the note goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on so if you're really interested in general employee stock purchase plans or guests, you can go and look at this. But I am officially done talking about 3M's stock option accounting. And that wraps up our week on stockholders' equity. And it also wraps up the new material that we're going to cover in the course. Wow, it seems like it was just nine weeks ago that we started this adventure. And now we've worked our way all the way around the balance sheet. What we're going to do next week is go through a different financial statement and try to do a comprehensive financial statement analysis. So goodbye 3M. Next week, hello Vulcan. I'll see you then.